Welcome back to the Geek on My Sleeve channel. This is Geek Out number 100. And uh, what a ride it has been. This is going to be over Ravenous. Um, by, I don't have my stuff up, silly me. I want to say David Petri. Yeah. Yes. David Petri. And normally we don't include the publication just because, but this is by Mountaindale Press, and that uh, is irrelevant for several reasons. Yes, yes, yes. Congrats to you, Pete, to us on making it to 100 Geek Out live streams. Um, this has been a passion project of ours for a while now, having a lot of fun doing it. Pete and I um, pretty much for years would have our own little geek outs talking about what audiobooks we were listening to and wanted to do this project to kind of carve out a little corner of the internet 
for friends and family to join us. Um, read along if they're interested. Otherwise, just listen, hang out, geek out over the super fun stories. And yeah, in in the meantime, like it's just further fan the flames of uh, our passion for lit RPGs, which seems to be where we've been hanging out a lot lately. Yep. 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 Yeah. So here's to a hundred more. Uh, going to try to keep chilling with you guys every Sunday. That's always subject to change. Uh, catch us in the Discord. Watch our social media. Hey, Carlos. Good to see you, buddy. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. And so, so I, I guess sidestep. We uh, we do have uh, affiliate links in the description below. Sorry about being kind of behind the ball on getting these published to know what we're supposed to be reading for the next week. The idea is a lot of our viewers are audible and, you know, faster than one time speed. We comfortably sit at, you know, two to three X speed. Uh, Try to give you enough time to get to it. So if you haven't um, read it yet, and you want to pick it up, link in the description below. And for those of you who haven't picked it up yet, it, uh, I guess, kind of a spoiler-free-esque portion. So, if, or I guess, anyway, here we go. Mountaindale Press is relevant because it is owned by Dakota Kraut. Dakota Crow writes a series, Divine Dungeon, Completionist Chronicles, as well as he does a couple other things in that universe, uh, Wolfman, Warlock, Arturian Archives. But if you enjoy the Divine Dungeon series, no, it's not written by Dakota Kraut. The puns are not as, there's not as many puns, but it, the one thing that I thoroughly enjoy or is my favorite throughout the Divine Dungeon series is it's a lit RPG, but it's more like a fantasy lit RPG where there's not the typical trope of trapped in the game or travel to another world. It is in, you know, if everything went south, aha, there's magic. So I really enjoy the aspect of magic was real. And then we end up, you know, having an accent dying. And then, yeah, as we, you know, un- we thaw and uh, bring the magic to the the current world or time to the and, new world yeah you bum, can bum, definitely bum. tell the that world. there's a lot of similar writing styles um and that's a big one the fact that just how the lit rpg is set up and then the secondary one kind of relates more with completionist chronicles about how if you display your understanding the in that or in completionist chronicles the game will give you the power Where for this one, when they do non-magic related things, the power will, you know, be translated into magic, which was pretty cool. But yeah, we follow around a 800-year-old zombie that ends up starting the zombie apocalypse. Fits in with our October Halloween theme here. And I, I really enjoyed it. Good. Before we jump into the spoiler e part, let me cue this guy. All right. So, yeah, spoiler warnings ahead on Ravenous, a zombie apocalypse lit RPG. So. I don't know about you, but when I first looked at this story, um, I was kind of hesitant. It really didn't initially excite me. Like, I like zombies and everything, but typically, and we joke about all the lit RPG tropes, right? You know, like, typically we follow a programmer 
or somebody in the Nomadic, medical industry yeah. and they're ultra nerd who then like a set guy gets teleported to another world and like that tends to be what like lit rpg typically is not typically well, but very that's why commonly I so enjoy it because it's a different flavor it's yes yes it's, and it, it was executed well and it fits within the premise of the book you know being a you know eight eight hundred year old british guy who was you know essentially just a commoner who wasn't you know a saint wasn't the best guy in the world but also he was, he wasn't was a peasant, you know a, more or less a scumbag and yeah uh, he he ends up getting to where he is because he was an opportunist hoping to rob you know this wealthy elite who was accused of being a witch we, we get the flashbacks there um you know first yeah, half that of the was book. also done really well for me that's that's one yeah. thing that everybody has kind of a different twist on um sidestep brandon sanderson always does a little blurb or a snippet or you know quote at the beginning of each of his chapters mm -hmm. and it's information that isn't always relevant at the moment but then there's typically a aha moment and then it all you have to kind of go back and they start to make more sense um that's not exactly where this is going and personally i don't typically care for the we're in the middle of an epic moment and then it's like well hold on let me tell you how i got here and then we back up so right. the way this one was right. executed and it made sense with the zombie nature of how he had all his attributes reset so he's at zero and mm -hmm. then he's degraded because he's been frozen in ice for 800 years but the irony and the joy of you are your own AI companion in a sense. It's not really, oh, but it is where the heretic he seed dies and the heretic seed absorbs him as a, a copy more or less. And then with that, he ends up, you know, kind of being his own conscious. I, so okay. I, I really enjoyed that aspect. Yeah. Um, I'm getting a random flag saying I'm having a connection issue for my speed. Um, I was about so... to say you're you're pretty choppy right now. I can hear you okay. Um, do you are you do you want to try to troubleshoot it or keep pushing through? Or uh, yeah, we'll we'll keep going. I'll mess with stuff. Yeah. Um. It. it yeah interesting concept the heretic seed uh we get the snarky comments when he's quote unquote leveling up from the heretic seed but what kind of caught me off guard was when he actually was able to have like full-blown conversations when he quote unquote died right our scott lynch or carlos says cough scott lynch i'm drawing a blank on the name must have been in reference to uh or the, the uh, beginning quotes or the yeah. flashback gentlemen's bastard series i don't know that i've read that um but yeah and then the other interesting mechanic he got is for every year he survived he received 10 xp Right. So the fact that it was he a was a mage to... before he died and then the 10 XP per year, you're right. It was a way to kind of help him boost it. Yeah, it gave him a leg up. And now I don't want to say too much because I've actually read all three. It... Oh, I, I guess we the elements that I can speak on in behalf of book one are the moment right before the nuke drops where the guy i can't remember his name comes over the video chat as they're flying mm -hmm. away and then he's like wait so and so they're like 
you know, Graves, is that you? And it's, we get the whole, the he's been alive that... for 800 years, yeah, who yeah. initially wanted him to go take out the witch, and now, mm -hmm. in a roundabout way, he is the witch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so... It, it... It, the difference between like 10 XP, which even throughout this book is nothing, oh, nothing. and 800 plus years of life with the Eight, power. 8,000 XP. Um, still, it's nothing, but it is a nice way to kind of help explain what makes him different than other zombies. Um, because he was a mage before he became a zombie, and then he got all that additional XP. Right. And by having the heretic seed kind of like be there in the back of his mind, like at the very beginning, he's just painfully dumb. Right. Like he's reading through his stats and everything after he's kind of like come alive from eating, like um, satiating his hunger, no longer becoming ravenous. He, he ate the first two and he bit the third that thought him out. And we're going to what their intentions were, dissect him, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it was a nice way to kind of explain what made him unique. And then the heretic seed keeps smacking him um, in the back of the head. It, you know, pick intelligence, pick intelligence, pick intelligence. Yeah. No, you don't need that. No, you don't need that. Um, and then sure enough, he picks intelligence, dumps all his stats in there. And now he's actually able to somewhat think and not just you know mm, brain yeah but then it he also sticks true to his you know his character where he's pretty easygoing and just trying to get by where sure he uh oh he's his abilities don't work and he's like stubborn about it like no it's gonna work i need something and then mm -hmm. yeah just keep the trying, whole scenario trying. he's trying he tries to save the uh, Azure and then, you know, so, taking the horde and taking out the the brute. Yeah, we, we've talked about it before. I, I get annoyed when, you know, like if I'm in the mood, it could be fun to have like a really overpowered main character. Right. Like that, that can be fun if you're in the mood and you just want to like, you know, stomp face throughout the whole book. But if you're not in the mood, it kind of gets old, right? So um, Digby Graves, very, very generic name that we can actually remember it. Um, or Lord Graves. Or I, I thought zombie. it was because of the, the pun. Yeah, Dig Graves. And everybody stop and catch him. Uh, but anyway, like, as he's going, he's a mage, and he's, like, trying to learn Fireball. It would be super OP if he actually was able to just, like, start casting fireballs from chapter two and just melting stuff. But uh, yeah, like, but I plays... enjoyed the versatility of the class kit because a lot of it, a lot of hack and slash in the lit RPG realm. So the sure. fact that he's got to play more of a, I guess my mind, I think control mage where he's got to mm -hmm. subjugate a zombie and then that reduces its stats. What's up? A tank mage? Isn't he almost like a tank mage to some degrees? He ends up uh, eh, the couple no, interactions I, he has. I still think because he, he ends up getting his claw. Okay. Eh, okay. Fair enough, yeah, fair but he he gets where he can control units. He can True. you know change their mind. He can attack at range with his fire, and then he can attack at range with his blood spikes. He, he learns he can attack at range with the fire later, only if it's dead flesh, right? Which no, I thought that, was a nice part little of, balance. That's what he learns right at the get-go, when he can't cast fireball. He... Yeah, yeah. I was tying that into the original comment where if he actually learned how to cast a fireball, like projected at anybody it'd be one thing but he pretty much is able to just like ignite dead flesh oh yeah, a certain yeah the, range. The so the from the get -go, yeah he can use yeah like little heads you know grab them by the hair ignite them and you know throw them i guess yeah yeah his own version of it mm-hmm so with him being 800 years old, 
clearly there's going to be some differences between the eras, right? Mm -hmm. He went from, you know, he has the talks about demons in his blood and needing to go to church to uh, the dialogue about like, oh, viruses and, you know, just like everything, like just a massive leap in technology. Do you feel like it was handled well as he kind of I, went through yeah, the learning yeah, curve? Because... Like there were some things that were clearly like WTF. Oh, it, it was done very well with all the elements included. It has zombies, which is like apocalypse. It has an 800 year old person who is not going to know anything about the technology. And then we have a, hey, I'd consider it kind of an advancement, but not really because, you know, surprise, surprise, we do use drones and military ventures, but there's a lot of, you know, advanced tech and whatnot in a civilian setting mm -hmm. um so the way between the heretic seed and his analyze ability adding in certain layers and mm -hmm. uh oh becky uh giving him information and then oh it's alex right yeah, I was going to say it starts with an A and it's not Asher. It's, I want to say, yeah, a Alex. Asher's his bird. So, this, or it's this, a, the first kid who dies and the bird. Yeah. This is a good book for us because the names are pretty easy for us to remember and talk about on live stream. Becky, Alex, and Graves, the yeah. mage zombie from 800 years ago. I really got a kick out of um, when Becca was explaining uh the american revolution or whatnot oh yeah and he's getting hung up on the why they threw the tea yeah yeah he's like so, what what um it was kind of funny like it, see all the memes about how much technology and power we have and if somebody came from the past they'd be like so you can have like almost any question answered at your fingertips and you spend the majority of your time like looking at cat memes or something like that, or, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, we got a couple of those moments where he's like, wait, what you guys have yeah. all this going on. And then just also some of the culture shocks too. when she's explaining her situation, um, which is not too uncommon. She pretty much works remotely, but on base for the company, right? Um, the Phoenix company, Oh, the so core. that was probably my um, only thing that I guess it didn't quite fully pan out in my mind. Because, like, I understand if they only have, like, one or two apartments for their people and they're locked down and whatnot. But it didn't make sense, like, if they've got a facility like that, why isn't the whole building those people? Because they do have door guards. So you're telling me you've got door guards, but then you've got basic run-of-the-mill civilians throughout it i i don't know i just i figured a, it works for the story good question and right. for our core but like maybe they I, have a whole level where they do other stuff but why is she just isolated there and not more I, yeah, like resources it, it there? definitely is soon to be irrelevant after the bomb went off but it, that, that was my, my only little hiccup that I had, and I'm probably just overthinking it, but I did I did enjoy our uh, the way we assemble our team. Right. Point I was going to make is um, the, the culture difference and perspective, like from Graves, where she's kind of explaining the situation where people putting in long hours and working a lot is relatively common or working away from home, et cetera, et cetera. And he's pretty much like, you know, that sounds a lot like slavery to me sort of a deal. And just like some of those little culture shock references where you stop and you take a look and it's like, you know, looking at it from that point of view, you're, you're not wrong. Um, but yeah. And then just some of the other things had some fun little laugh out loud moments. Yeah, um, I as well as like, or I guess sidestep. One thing I forgot to mention is this book uh, fits into the category of main character dies stories over, except for the main character dying is the story beginning. 
You need um, to make a list of those books. I yes. If you're looking for 27 books on, you know, I, I see I, it now. And it's kind of one of those forwardly backwards things where like I like when I find them and it's unique how they deal with it. But at the mm. same time, I don't want you to tell me it before I get into it. Mm, fair enough. Because like enough. It, it could have ruined a couple of them. Because it wouldn't yeah. have been as intense. For, yeah, for this I, book, though, um, where it's a zombie apocalypse, uh, I, I don't think we were ruining much by saying main character, dead, story over. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I follow. I follow. Uh, as well as like, I really enjoyed the scaling overall. Like, I was the just fact about to ask you about we that. We start off as, you know, I think level eight zombie with very poor stats, and we slowly get enough intelligence to we're literally fighting a guy swinging around a great sword, and it turns out that we've had this magic all along in a different form. Um, and yeah it, it, between dying but not dying and yeah it's an underdog story where we're rooting for the heretic seed side against you know the whole guardian core where they're all like noble holy knights and everything and we have um our oh what they call themselves like a coven i can't with, remember uh, the name. Yeah, yeah. Just, you know, led by Lord Graves. All that fun stuff. Um, yeah, the scaling, I, I agree with you. It's done really well because we start out in the building oh. that he wakes up in for a while, right? Mm -hmm. And he comes to, we get, we learn a little bit about that. And during that time, we also learn about kind of the entry level uh, zombie mechanics because all zombies are different depending on the the storyline you follow right and so we get to learn yeah. a bit about that as he's kind of working through his own powers and figuring things and coming to and even though we end up kind of doing a full circle as far as like progress goes around seattle it scales well as you know my Becca's not on his side then he's betrayed then we we find um our our boy who was going to be a jumper but instead we offered him awesome epic powers and then as we protect him and the the guardian cores like slowly scale up on trying to take him down because they're trying to quote unquote get control of this whole city right or not um we kind of get some hints through Becca's point of view where oh uh, we're not at that phase yet we're not rescuing people like it's it's clear that they're not there to save people and extract them it's more about the zombies and we get to see more and more of that as it progresses to hey wait these guys are literally dropping zombies into other areas other parts of the world and letting it run rampant um, and we don't quite understand why I was going to say it. Yeah. It, after reading the, the three books, no spoilers. It does a Only book one. very good job kind of la, 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 la. building out the story contained inside book one. You, you get the feel from the beginning where essentially Dig Graves is like, well, you know, I've got to hide these bodies. Uh, okay, well, looks like they have more to worry about than just mm -hmm. me. I just need to find a safe space and progress and to level up. And then, like, mm -hmm. even as he's talking to Becca, he's talking about, hey, I'm going to eventually make it so that, you know, maybe I can reverse the curse or, or do other things. And we just get to see the progression there, as well as, like, I, I thoroughly enjoy the progression of his abilities and how um, and how he 
is developing him. You know, he is doing things that aren't a part of the heretic seed and they're being accepted. And then we also run into the moment he gets the manacles on him where his mm -hmm. heretic seed powers are negated, but his zombie powers aren't. So he's... I, I thought that was pretty clever. That was clever as well as like... It's an amalgamation where from the beginning, when he gets the intelligence, he's able to not have to go down a path and he can he ends up picking one from each of the strands. So, yeah, he's not going to be a min maxer in one regard, but it, he, he ends up so, control mage so for the versatility. How much of that little bit there is part of the reason why you enjoy it so much? Because you it's it's becoming not more necessarily and a more common in lit RPGs where it's almost not Please. as much of a standard for uh hey. min maxing. Yeah. But that is by far, yeah, that, that's a big draw for me because I always enjoy hybrid builds. Um mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I understand why maxing out your DPS makes sense, but uh, there, there's situational tactical advantage from, you know, doing enough damage to either make them feel overconfident because you're not a threat, and so you can tunnel and funnel and bring them back to, you know, home base where you get the others involved or you know being able to help out with that additional healing when you know some squishy pulls aggro or right. you know yeah just versatility carlos says spike player so i wonder if that's in reference to like the glass cannons like all all damage or um yeah I was gonna say I don't know the reference spike player. It's it's nice to see different classes though, and Digby's I, character is a lot of fun in that regards. Uh, but it's not all just straight up magic, right? Because we're in modern age, so there's still some of the, you know, the science technology we get introduced to, you know, not introduced, but they use firearms, grenades. We get to see. Uh, Graves try to figure that piece out where like he he sees how grenades work but doesn't understand the pull the pin mechanic. So he ends up throwing a grenade back to them just to be used. Um yeah, and that that was another one that was just well done as in regards to like figuring out certain elements but not fully understanding everything. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, but that that scene was well done. And then we also. Mm, Carlos says, sorry, I spike is magic. magic the gathering. gathering. Yeah. Referring to min maxing. I thought you were saying you were one. Mm, can be, I... but I think Pete likes to play the hybrid builds a lot more. Yeah. I'm, I'm more of a, I enjoy the hybrid. And in I, regards to card games, I always, you know, play too many colors. So, uh, yeah, you're you're like, oh, I'm waiting for that my card land? so I can set up this combo. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, I miss card games. Um, let's see here. So. Throughout the journey, we do meet a handful of civilians, which I thought was pretty interesting to see the interactions like between the two kids, the two black kids we find as um, he's finally getting some ground away from them. Yeah, no, uh, just to have Becca, yep, yep, lead them back to safety. And we do get to see a bit of that journey with him because when we see him reflect and have his flashbacks he was pretty much a loner in his previous life so in a lot of ways him being an undead zombie is like a rebirth and he does save asher relatively early on 
um, which kind of starts it. And he was just trying to help him out and, you know, send him on his way. And then we get to see how the Phoenix company is more corrupt than we realize as they see that he's hiding a bite and just go and shoot him. Yeah. Um, we later learned that I think he was on the younger side. So that's part of the reason why they want to save him. We learned that they recruit people just like Becca at a young age to start grooming them for um, their, their guardian um, department where they end yeah. up seeming to get these powers similar to the heretic seed. Hi, Josh. Asks, how is everyone? I'm doing well. How are you? Yeah, long week and uh, highlight of our, our weekend being able to hang out with you guys and just geek out over today. Ravenous yep. and all it's fun. Um, but as I was saying, like he kind of progresses and he develops an attachment to Becca um, and then is betrayed. And Alex, there was a couple times where it would have been in his best interest survival wise to leave him because, you know, we kind of have that heart to heart between Alex and Graves after one of his earlier fights with the guardians. I think it's the first fight since he got away. Like he gets ambushed when he takes the kids back mm -hmm. and then he gets away and the guardian core catches up with him. He thinks one of them was guarding the door, but it ends up being Alex who we later find out he was just looking for a really tall building to jump from. Um, and he kind of shares how his life was going to shit. And then, um, you know, the zombie apocalypse happened and, you know, all nerds joke about the zombie apocalypse. Um, I, I always like to play the game when you walk into a new room. It's like, okay, the zombie apocalypse happened. You know, what's the escape route? Like, where are we going? Um, so people joke about it and talk about it. And then we get to see kind of, through Alex's perspective, what a lot of probably the average reader is, um, you know, young adult male zombie apocalypse. We all think uh, we're, we're going to be the savior of mankind when in reality, most of us are zombies. We get bit. Um, and then, you know, what do people do? They hide the bites and then they get more bites and so on and so forth. Uh, but it, yeah, he meets him, gives him the ring, and as the heretic seed is kind of like doing his rewiring to give him the lit RPG mechanics, he passes out. And then we get, depending on your perspective, round two with the Guardians, right? Yep. Yeah. We get the, oh, tank, not tank, heavy armored vehicle. Right. Yeah. It, it, it's a good book. I enjoyed it. it. I felt like the pacing was good as far as introducing us to the mechanics. Um, it, I, I got hooked and I was glad that I waited a little bit before picking up this book um, because Mountain Dale Press, just like uh, James A. Hunter's, I think it's like Shadow Alley something. Like there's a handful of publishing groups that we just watch to see new stuff come out. And I remember this one dropping. And since we waited, I ended up picking up the next two in the series. So we're current with it. Um, we were trying so hard not to do that just so we don't spoil it for you guys. But this one has a pretty easy, clean break where we ride off into the sunset with radiation poisoning um, from the nuclear blast in Seattle, right? Yeah. Though I was disappointed we didn't get the horse because the that would have been ship epic. flew over us but at the end of one after we crash we see the horse so maybe mm. exciting mm. um and then we also get to see our main guy who's been around for 800 years takes one of the only survivor from the phoenix company in i can't remember the location we're fighting in um mm -hmm. and he ends up 
feeding him to the zombies. So it just adds a more context and a lot, you know, like we already knew they were taking the zombie and spreading them out and infecting people. We know we kind of have an insight that it's due to the pure monotype because typically people have a spread or, you know, not a 100% or proficient channel. But Graves has the 100% yeah. affinity or whatever our magic term is for this book. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, and that's another thing that's very similar to uh, Divine Dungeon, where they have a numbering system, but it's primarily a lettering system for advancements, mm -hmm. for spells. Right. Um, yeah, we, we get a little bit of a tease with uh, Graves' apprentices. We finally, we do end up saving Becca uh, towards the end there. She gets her ring, granting her the powers. Alex got his ring, granting the powers. Um, I think- And then we got the bird. Yes, yes, Asher, which I'm, I'm kind of excited to see the potential there. Having yeah, a bird-like zombie that you rank up and the difference. That's another just like great mechanic that they added because it started off kind of what you're talking about. Then we first um, gave Alex the ring and he's passed out. He uses mm -hmm. his zombie horde to, you know, essentially tell other zombies, hey, there's going to be a lot of food. Everybody come here. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. yeah. Oh, that, that stunt he pulls with the, is that this book? The rats? Rats are this book. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I want to let you tackle this one, Pete. Josh commented, I haven't read Divine Dungeon yet, but I see you guys referring to it quite a bit. Would you recommend it? Divine Dungeon. I, so I thoroughly enjoyed the Divine Dungeon series. You will like it if you enjoy. It's kind of like a soft lit RPG there are leveling and progression um it's a little bit more i guess fantasy-esque where you've got you know elves and amazonians and dwarves um but it's got a lot of very cool magic archetypes throughout it and it it's kind of a a parallel series where you have a sentient dungeon that can learn and grow and develop as well as you know it's the uh oh i can't think of the word it's not a parasite but where both are beneficial to each other because you've got the adventurers who <laughs> want to kill the uh creatures that way they can get loot and you have the dungeon who wants the adventurers to come through that way they can refine so i i really enjoy the mechanics it's great because they're they're pretty short and quick they progress quickly and yeah it's, it's a more so fantasy-esque soft lip than rpg uh, but the big reason is because it is kind of the foundation for the rest of um dakota kraut series because yeah they each of his series could be considered independent but he's building quite a vast world throughout everything and yeah the the progression is unreal and dakota kraut is amazing at his easter eggs or causal connections where he takes things referenced in one book and relates them to another one where if you didn't read his other series you know it's not a big deal you're not missing out on anything but as a gamer i really enjoy easter eggs so yeah yes and um as we said earlier dakota kraut author of divine dungeon is also um you know owner of mountaindale press yep yep which, which that's put out this series so it's it's a great gateway into lit rpg and it's more of like a cultivation based book than a like you were saying a hard 
lit RPG mechanics. And yeah, you, you've probably listened to the first book how many times now, Pete? Oh, let's see. There's five in the series, so at least five and then there's seven days in a week so for each five that we did <laughs> five times off oh, math uh, yeah probably. 30 well, 40 40 ish yeah. 40 that's just for the to times look. that we were doing geek outs and then all those other times you go back just to scratch that itch well because then we have series. the completionist chronicle series and then i gotta read them again to check out the references but by that time i'm i was a little more dialed in for what might be referenced in what book but then we went through the arturian archive series and yeah it's and and you've talked about it before like the the spectrum of lit rpg where divine dungeon a lot less of like the like hard video game mechanics but they're there and then I think Ravenous is like the next step up where in a lot of ways it's very similar to Divine Dungeon where there is a magic system. Um, and it is like in the current realm, it's not like we got teleported to another universe or something like that or, or in a, living in a video game. Um, it's like common day Seattle. But it has a way to kind of show the information and communicate the information magically directly into your head that sets it up in a video game mechanic sense yeah so it's like that having a step. hud and level mm -hmm. progression and sharing becca, xp and yeah becca one of the main characters is a drone operator and she pretty much says like oh what you see is very similar to what i see in my drone and then alex pretty much makes the same comparison with common day video games so in that sense um, when you're talking about like the lit RPG of spectrum of like soft to hard, I think it's like that next step. And then you get, you know, further down the line with like ascend, um, the completionist chronicles, where it's very much more people who play MMOs would feel right at home with the stats dump and everything else. We get some of that, like we get our XP, we track it. Uh, but I I don't mind that stuff. I didn't find it overwhelming at all when they did the stats dump. It's it was actually for, pretty for, for ravenous. Books? No, for ravenous. Oh, yeah. It's pretty I, low. Yeah. It's more like post fight cleanup type deal. Um just to help us keep track of where his levels are approximately and his new abilities and all that fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I just felt like it was it was pretty sparse for relevant for when it happens, mm -hmm. you know, talking to the horse and getting the yeah, I can't remember the actual name, the animal whisper ability mm -hmm. that he can bestow on others, which then he yeah. gives it to Alex and Alex uses it on the rats. And it's it's well done. Some other books feel the need to remind you of all those details every single time which I don't I, mind when I'm listening to it at such I'm a fast rate because some blank. of them, they get a lot of abilities. So it's good to be reminded of, hey, this is what it's capable of. He who fights with monsters. There we so, go. Life reset is kind of like, hey, we're about to do some stuff. Here's a recap or an update on all of our epic, awesome abilities and powers. Now I'm going to go do them so you know what they are. He yes. who fights with monsters is like in the throes of combat. And as we're utilizing our ability, it's a reference to, hey, this is what we're utilizing. And this is the effect it's going to have, you know. And then for Ravenous, it's more... Hey, you're an 800, 800 year old zombie and you're trying to figure everything out. So you're doing stuff because you have different understandings. Meanwhile, the heretic seed and, you know, the heretic ring and all that are taking your basic actions and turning them into abilities that you can utilize. Yes. So they all do it very well. Quick comment on he who fights with monsters. I feel that 
it's almost necessary for that book simply because of the amount of abilities everybody has. And when you're following the party of five, where they have potentially like a dozen plus different abilities each, um, those who don't binge them as hard as we do, where they I, literally just read it or listened to it like, you know, an hour, hour or two ago. Um, there's a lot there. Ravenous, it does it really well. And it makes a lot more sense when you start to understand kind of like how the heretic seed, as you said, is acting like the AI, where the information is provided pretty much when it's called upon. So it's not always up in their face. And they talk about how he can kind of customize his HUD and change some of those dynamics where well, like, I don't, I don't need Alex's full that, name on there, you know, you let's know. just put boy or Becca up by their name instead of all the details. But it messes him up quite a few times too. Cause he'll try to uh, take over a zombie. And because it's not a basic zombie, he ends up angering a leader and now they're right. chasing him. And uh, you he, know. Didn't, he didn't appraise first or whatnot. Yeah which I think is funny. Um, well, it's the the opposite of most of the starts for lit RPGs because most of them, it's turn off combat notifications. You know, you'll be in the middle of something. Mm -hmm. And for example, the land at the beginning, it's, you know, he turns it off and right. leaves them for later. But in yeah. this one, it's convenient but if he just sticks with his standard button rotation so to speak uh he it turns out he should have looked before he leaped yeah yeah so all in all um how did it rank for you on combat so there was quite a bit of combat I was intrigued because of the development of the abilities and the powers. It wasn't your typical hack and slash. It wasn't, you know, he didn't capitalize on one or the other. He became an amalgamation, which I really enjoy. Um, after book one, he very much feels like a control mage kind of deal because he's got his uh, necrotic flesh thing where he can light it on fire. Um, and he's got to, you know, roll against their will attribute. But then he's also got, you know, can sacrifice another spell or more mana for controlling them first, which then mm -hmm. reduces their will because now they're friendly. And then we end up figuring and like the, the progression and figuring out the abilities is beautiful for you know, he's up against the, uh, oh, the one who has the jaw traps that I can't think of the name of it. Um, anyway, but essentially he, he gets his void ability and then he realizes that inside his void, he can, you know, it's where he stores everything so then he can shoot spikes out of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Aligned with, you know, just being in a war zone and grenades being a thing. So just the versatility through everything. Cause I mean, right. in one sense, it was kind of like a continuous walking combat, but in the other sense, it was assembling our party. So it wasn't. Over yeah. Combat. Yeah. It, it was an organized retreat, but it, wasn't like a complete utter panic the whole time yeah yeah oh man that clutch moment at the end uh he's dropping a, a nuke on him and he's struggling trying to rack his brain how to get throughout or through it and he ends up getting barrier and then modifying it or not having the manner type and modifying it Mm hmm yeah it was a good book it, it definitely surprised me and i think something that i constantly have to remind myself and i fall into the trap just like a lot of other people is um your expectations going into new series 
it's really easy to get ourselves overhyped or kind of like under promise with some books when we pick it up. And I, I came in relatively lower expectations and was really surprised by the book, how much I enjoyed it and how well it was executed. And it did a good job with kind of the promises of what the story was going to be as we went through it. Right. Like it's not your massive dungeon crawler lit RPG or um, it's not even directly zombie apocalypse survival. Like uh, we were just talking about the rapture um, and that that book series that we did, it's pretty much, you know, um, it, at, through the flashbacks, we get the story of how these two different guys, one, all we know is that he was from his village. There's some witch. Let's round up everyone in the tavern. We're going to go get ourselves a witch and burn her at the stake. And um, yeah, like I can't remember how far we go through in the first book. So I don't want to like straight up spoiler it, but we still have this war going on 800 years later and Digsby Graves the main character ends up starting the zombie apocalypse yet so much of it was out of his control. Like when he started the initial infection, he wasn't even quite conscious or aware yet. Well, right. And so that, that kind of leads into Josh's question here. Is there a race system, um, humans, high elves and such? And so no, it's based in modern day. So they're all humans but the the modifier is so our main guy digby has a part of the heretic seed and then our main opposition that we find out towards the end has created his own modifier for it that then he can bestow on people mm -hmm. and i guess after kind of the start we end up with like zombies so we get those and then they end up with like several i guess i think of them kind of like tear trees where you have some who grow bone armor you have some that are massive juggernaut type characters you have some that are you know charisma stat max but not really for being a leader and helping out other, or you know kind of leading others um so it's yeah it's currently humans and zombies with a flavor of how you get your powers and that that was one thing that they hinted at for the beginning i think it's one of our flashbacks we get oh the heretic seed is a pillar and he's like oh is that a physical pillar and in my mind if you have a pillar there's never just one Otherwise, you would use different verbiage. And then it's, we assume the main guy, because he took the heretic shard out of his arm, and that's how he was living so long. And then he modified it. But which is probably I'm, part of how they have the Guardian Core, right? Yeah. And tap into it. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just curious for if there are more or others. We know what happens when we combine the powers. Hey, that's our... Yeah. <laughs> Captain Planet. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of which, did you get your DBZ reference in? I, I think we might have almost made a whole stream and you didn't do I... a DBZ reference. Oh my goodness. I was I, trying is not that, to is that go your, into other books. Is that your um, 100 stream gift? first stream ever without a dpz reference no i'm just playing and i guess the only thing that's somewhat that off the top of my head would be the atomic bomb at the end being a spirit bomb where you know he's just Taking casually talking to him about him like oh well sorry i couldn't bring you over to my side man you know people are slow i, I can't it takes me this long to get you know an airstrike inbound and right. you know the dragon ball that's like eight episodes of charging up and then let's time skip two to three years because you know nothing happened 
Yeah. Um, anyway, anyway. Uh, yeah. Really enjoyed the book. Did you do you feel like there were any other major scenes that we missed? Um, uh, I enjoyed probably. the hey ho, let's go during the quote unquote final fight. Like, um, it, yeah. I so that's an element that sidestep berserker the epicosmos series does well where they talk about music and if mm -hmm. you look up and or know the music it mm. helps you get into the mindset um for this it was more of a dakota crowd style or a pun or you know lighthearted get you in the different theme um mm -hmm. i enjoyed it i uh Mm, let's see. So we thaw, start the zombie apocalypse. Uh, first woman gets crushed and dies. Save Azure just for him to get his head blown off. Uh, work on escaping. Find the team other two Becky. kids. Yeah. Uh, go back, back. Get ambushed fight back figure out they have abilities to pick up alex um fight off more of them more abilities uh figure out how to get rats on our side and then the big battle for the end uh, mm -hmm. as well yeah, as where just... he dies but doesn't die yes gets uh carried in a duffel bag or no it's a body bag body bag okay carried in a body bag i thought it was yeah no, and now right. he started off with this purse to carry stuff that and then he, he upgrades to a duffel bag his goblin king cloak yep um yeah well that was something that i enjoyed um Oh, the Apocalypse Gate series does some stuff like that where due to people believing in something, it ends up with attributes. But mm -hmm. in this one, it, it kind of carries over or for this because people believe in it and it's, you know, fictional. It, uh, you know, carries attributes. Mm hmm. So Josh uh, says out of 10 for the first book, maybe he's asking how we would rate it on a 10 point scale. The first book. It's always so hard to rate them. Yeah. Cause it's, they all will have unique flavors. Mm -hmm. I, I would say a strong seven because as first books, it wasn't a super blase, boring, just world building. Mm -hmm. it, it was well done, kind of typical for, you know, I guess a D and D ask for we're assembling our party, which I thoroughly enjoyed. It gave enough teasers to where there's more behind the scenes story development. And, you know, we're just trying to survive at this point, but more and more we learned that the big bad has uh, definitely had a leg up and it just solidifies how much of an underdog we really are I, as well as the unique magic system for we have the heretic seed but then we also have our zombie abilities so the progress like the progression is probably the best out of it i i i'd put it a strong seven like it might hit eight or nine depending on which scale we're using uh yeah i was about to say I've already talked about how my perspective going into it, um, my expectations were pretty low, but I would say it's um, probably around an eight oh. for me on enjoyment. And it, it does a lot of things really well. Like everything you just outlined, the introduction to the world, the world building, um, really easy learning curve. I felt like every seen like things were continue to move along whether it was the world building the character development um understanding the factions and what's all going on behind the scenes 
where where stuff's at. Um, and yeah, picked up the next two. Uh, and it's it's got a good rereadability, right? You listened to it a couple times. Mm-hmm. I made him made it through all three at least once, and then since it was coming up, I primarily focused on the first one. Yeah, uh, I'm right there with you. Uh, like, I guess after three, the rereadability there's. Um, like in the later ones you don't need to go back for like abilities or powers because they're kind of like still developing and they're kind of all it's a very limited repertoire so they're continuing to be it's, it's more of like a wild star toolbar instead of a world of warcraft toolbar yeah 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 so not not so much for abilities i will say for the plot progression yes because you know like for example book one the epilogue where our guy's like oh yeah you know this is casual just call me bloody blah because i can't remember this guy's name because he had two scenes but um you know the (laughs) other guy's like oh yeah you know uh i'm totally scared i'm out of my wits here you're the head of everything and uh i'm pretty shook up but uh yeah i'm just gonna say what you expect i'm gonna do it for everybody else and he's like oh good and he pushes him into the zombie pit so it, it doesn't hold a lot of weight as far as book one but it's a good little tease it's yeah it's like wait what they're doing what now and the, i guess the, the give, give biggest me more, give me readability more. factor is all of the like flashbacks because i i kind of have like a full picture of it but it's it's slowly applied and it's done very uniquely where it has real world consequences you know he gets his first flashback and he's about to be stomped by stomped by the oh the brute or whatever and he gets saved and then he has another flashback and he's hiding on a pole about to be ripped to shreds by a horde so he has the potential of falling off and yeah it's just yeah flashbacks would probably be the biggest reread ability i'm with you there i'm with you um we're about approaching the hour mark um any final thoughts and or uh i kind of threw it towards peter did you decide what we're doing next week yeah i was going to I have to move this I, yeah i was going with apocalypse gate book two a valley of death um oh, okay by daniel oh. oh that's the uh here, I'll get rid of the banner for you. There you go. Uh, Shkahopin? Yeah. I am sorry for butchering the name. So this is another zombie lit RPG. We've covered the first book. Um, the premise is... Correct me if I'm wrong here, Carl. I'm trying to remember. The main guy dies and is put, his brain is put into a simulation and it's for the enjoyment of others because it's essentially you're dead, so you don't have any rights. We put you into a simulation, but the reality is that's our only viewpoint. Uh, There apparently are other players so to speak and it it follows a weird game mechanic and it starts off where you do quests and based off of your kills and if you completed the objective you'd get points you can spend these points on a new baseball bat or new weapon um or you know as it progresses you can use them to upgrade your gun so it you know, does it need to be reloaded or increase the durability because mm-hmm. that's the kind of world we live on, live in. I, so it's a very unique twist on lit RPG. 
and it doesn't really incorporate much more of coming back to the real world and it kind of like sets the foundation for the vibes of our main character also i guess disclaimer there is some adult themes so there's there's more I... than some adult oh, themes okay okay but those who don't want adult themes in their stories this is not for you yeah i it, i it would is say not erotica, it is not one that but you do get you know the full scope of this is a man living in a zombie apocalypse simulation he is the protagonist there may or may not be dragons let's let's go um yeah yeah so i yeah it, it fits in for our, our october which i guess we're going with a zombie theme uh yeah that's uh zombie october yeah we were looking for other things but nobody's done vampires or werewolves or uh, eh. there's some but like or, it's not a core I theme i think or no, I already told you no. But sidestep, uh, um, Dakota Kraut and James A. Hunter, Wolfman Warlock Book Two is coming out the twenty something. This month? E no, uh October this month? Yeah, this one. Uh, we're I, in October. I just I just scrolled past it on Facebook. Uh, we're we're not the best with time and space. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's exciting. If that's the case, yeah, I'm I'm down to rock that one. Trying to be yeah. better about staying in theme. October, happy wow. Halloween, all that good stuff. Um Let's see, popping that. Josh asks, have you guys read Defiance of the Fall? It's ongoing. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we've have. Um, but we are always I, looking yeah, for new have. book suggestions. What I do is I end up adding them all to my wish list wish on list, Audible. Yeah. And then it says, hey, guess what? Come spend your money today because it costs less. And I'm like, okay, I think uh, audiobook collection 700 plus. Uh, I... We might have that in, we might have picked that up on a sale. That's like, at least the cover thing. looks For somewhat the familiar. Time. Uh, never mind. Just kidding. Oh, it's in the wish list though. Yep, it's already on our wish list. Uh, it's been recommended at least by Audible a couple times. But yes, definitely going to check that out, Josh. Keep tossing those suggestions our way. Um, and for those who want to support our Audible book habit and make sure we have plenty of content to keep talking to you guys about, shameless plug of affiliate links down below and the best way to support us and it doesn't cost anything is to continue to hang out with us on sundays geek out with us um even if you can't on sundays re-watching helps us out i don't know if we did this shout out but we passed 500 subs on our youtube so thank you thank you for all the support guys um, yeah, Carlos added it to his good read. Um, another plug, uh, I believe Carlos has launched his first video. Um, been on the channel a couple times about to finish up the lost fleet stream with him. That has been an amazing read along. Well, not finish. I think we're finishing the second series. I could be wrong, but yeah. I'll make sure to update the description below with all the different references after the stream. Go check those out. Appreciate the support. Um, what else, Pete, in regards to housekeeping for our 100th stream? Salute. Mm -hmm.
Mm, yeah, man, a lot to orchestrate, orchestra, conduct. Why is it called orchestrate when it's conductor who leads the orchestra? Or are they not related? Anyway, uh, haha, we sure want thoughts. to do a podcast. And by do a podcast, I mean take the video podcast and turn it into a podcast but we uh haven't quite solidified that yet we peter and i have a lot of things that we've been talking about that we want to do going into quarter four of this year and getting on board for next year um as always appreciate the support um and the feedback you guys give us in the comments and then on discord podcast hopefully coming out here soon um as well as a couple other projects i know we keep teasing about a number of them in the earlier streams but yeah adulting parenting all that good stuff um yeah it's, yeah. yeah 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 anything else pete mm. Nope. Valley of the Death. Apocalypse Gates next week, Sunday, 5 p.m. Eastern. Yep. Next one coming up. We'll try to, you know, get back to having about a month out. Um, there's a lot that have recently came out that I was hoping of doing, but didn't make sense. Like, uh, oh, Up a Cosmos, book two uh magus i want to say came out on audible for book two beautifully done i want to get into that oh book four of mm, now oh, it's where the family gets transported oh yeah life in exile life in exile we need has to get come that out. one done Wolfman yeah. Warlock is coming up. Have, you, have you done Life in Exile book four yet? I have not. I got through it. It's it's getting good. It's getting yeah. good. There, there's a lot on our uh, yeah TBR that we're excited for. The side series for Life Reset. We're still waiting on the audiobook for that, but I'm excited about that continuing. Um, and there's just so many series that we've already started, guys. If you're getting caught up with us on some of the other streams just let us know um what series you guys would like us to s continue doing that, we're so behind but ultimately there's a new function i need to play with inside of youtube i don't know if there's any qualifiers but you can set up got a it with our 500 system. yeah the community so, stuff and community, the community yep, stuff yep. we we need to do polls because initially we were doing kind of the scatter chat or the scatter shot tactic for a little bit of everything um we've kind of found the groove of lit rpg except for the, the, when the groove is um i i say hey peter i'm listening to all these different books which one do you want to talk about and then we talk Our, about well, it. Well, yeah, <laughs> but the variety of some days or some time, weeks, I guess, it's better to be like, hey, here's a series. We're going through the whole series, which we haven't done in a while. doesn't make a whole lot of sense versus the pinball of Witch's Life for bouncing throughout all of them. You know, my biggest challenge with that, Pete, is when we focus on a whole series and we do what we usually do. Um, we don't just stop at that book that week. Because if there's four books and we're doing it in a month, I'm on, I'm on book true. seven. I'm on book seven of the series by the time we're, we're talking about book one or book two. Just because, yeah. And then it's like, oh, wait. Like, oh my gosh, you think book one is good? wait until you get to book four where there's laser beams there's all this stuff like oh well, man we're, we just, we're just starting for... down here um, i know i know we... i'm just yeah yeah when, but when we take breaks and bounce around 
then even though we've gone through the whole series, we go back and we listen to that one and we see some of the other nuances that we didn't see on the first pass through. And yes. So thank you, Josh. See you yeah. next week as well. And then all the thank yous. Really appreciate the community and the chatting. Yeah. Um, Aaron Hall asked, did you see Audible came out with a new version of Lord of the Ring? Uh, Andy Circus? I need check I it out because... I don't know I... Andy Circus as a narrator, nor Lord of the Rings was before I was audiobook heavy. Lord of the Rings for me was the movies. Though, since I've seen some movie and book adaptations, I need to check out the books. I ended up, we ended up picking them up on sale, but it was the old version that we got on sale. Oh, the guy, the guy who did, who did Gollum, Gollum is the narrator. That, gosh, we're, I think we're about to own two copies of different oh, audible versions. We we do that, <laughs> though, where we'll pick up a book and then there'll be uh, a bundle series. Hey, I think we... Hey. I, yeah. I am Jeep, but I do not return the first book when I pick up the, the larger series. Support the authors, but yes, if we get book one and it's amazing and they're like, you like book one, well, for one credit, you can get all seven books. Yes, please. Yes, please. Um, but yeah, gosh, now that's mm -hmm. that's a blast mm -hmm. from the past yes. kind of book. I don't say I feel silly. Who's the author? Oh, Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien. Are they alive? They're no, still doing stuff. No, no. We we okay. could we could go deep down that anyway. that rabbit hole. Um, Gollum is spot on in narration. Yeah, and I'm looking at it. There's three additional hours in his reading. The Fellowship of the Ring by Rob Inglis is 17 hour or 19 hours seven minutes. Um, Andy Circus is 22 hours 38 minutes. Um, yeah. yeah carlos yeah. names are, are yeah yeah you already know you're the guy who's always got the names whenever we hang out yeah, name, yeah. names are not my forte no no he can remember all the other random abstract details but when it comes to names like are you wearing a name tag no hey you oh, yeah we got a uh, new guy at work and he's got one of the free bin shirts on so it's not his name, and it's not very helpful. <laughs> uh, anyway. Good times, good times. Well, um, as always, appreciate everybody who was able to hang out with us live. Carlos, Karen, Josh, um, always a pleasure. I think we might have to work in Lord of the Rings. Uh, I know we've binged the movies, but I don't know if you've ever listened to LOTR. It, it'd be interesting to get your perspective just because so many things have been cloned from Lord of the Rings and later stories, right? It's, it would be a classic for me. Yeah. It, it was a story of my younger years that was enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. I think I played I, I a went couple to... of their games as well. Yes. Never yes. picked up the book series. Yes, I keep one thing in you, and we could talk probably for another hour just on Lord of the Rings. But yeah, Karen says do it. Do it, do it, do it. Work Lord of the Rings in there. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, appreciate everybody. Yep. Next Sunday, same time, same place. Yep, for the foreseeable future. Bye. Hope to geek out with you here soon. Bye.